So today we hear from the book of Kings about the prophet Elijah, and it's a, a wonderful, and as, as is so often the case with scripture, a wonderful but subtle explanation of prayer. Okay, so we have Elijah on Mount Horeb, and there he's, so he's sent by the Lord into the wilderness. So he's on, on a mountain, and if you've ever been to the Holy Land, it's, it's I, I just, maybe just me being Irish, um, when I go to the Holy Land, I just find it really interesting that people have been basically fighting for that piece of territory for so long because it's, it's dry and it's rocky and it's dusty. You can have it. <laughs> like I'm used to fertile plains and lots of grass and trees and, uh, and some of the wildernesses there are absolutely that. Their wilderness is like they are barren, dry, rocky, dusty places. So when, when the Lord calls, again, keep in mind, the, the, the time period we're talking about. So there's no such thing as, uh, we, have, we have tinned foods, we have bread that lasts a week, we have you know, UHT milk that lasts forever because no one knows what it's made from. Uh, but it just you know, never goes off. We've all these, so if you're going camping, if you're going out for a while into the wilderness, you can bring food that will last. What could they bring? You know, dried dates, and even they, I don't know how long they last. Point is, when you're, when you're sent out into the wilderness by God, it's a real experience of your own littleness and emptiness and reliance on him. It's a, it's a, it's, you're abandoned to his providence because there is nothing out there. And you can't bring enough, even if you could, you can't bring enough with you to survive, you know, weeks or months. So when the Lord would say to anyone, go to the wilderness, that was a much bigger step than him asking us, do you want to go camping? Even like, we, sometimes for, for those who may not know, we go camping here in Holy Family sometimes, but our version of camping, it's fairly glamorous in fairness because we go the evening before, we have barbecued ribs and sausages because they're easy to, to cook, they're nice and thin. You don't want any thick meat because you mightn't be able to cook it through and you might kill someone. So, uh, and, and, and there we are, you know, in the, the, in the forest, lovely fire and ribs and sausages and bread rolls. I mean, sure, what more could you want? And then the following breakfast, sure, we'll have a fry while we're at it, and then we go home. So we just have one night in the forest, no misery. You don't really have to kind of forage for anything. We bring all of our food with us, and we're gone within 18 hours. Uh, so we, we call it camping, but it's not, really, it's not really camping. So it's a luxury. So when the Lord calls someone out into the wilderness, it's, it's rough. It's rough. So what, what's the so when Elijah goes, and what's his experience then out in the wilderness? The Lord calls him to go out and stand at the mouth of the cave because he himself was to pass by. Okay, so then Elijah's waiting for, for the Lord to pass by. It's an interesting kind of expression, you know, the Lord is going to pass by. Uh, what, does that, what does that mean? I mean... Obviously, keep in mind this is Old Testament, so Jesus hadn't come yet, so there's no incarnation. So God is going to pass by. What, does, what, what will that look like? So there's a mighty wind so strong that it tore the mountains and shattered the rocks, but the Lord was not in the wind. Then there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. So earthquake, I mean, the very ground you stand on is all shaking, but that's not where the Lord is either. Then there came a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. Then there came the sound, just the sound, of a gentle breeze. And at this point, Elijah covers his face in reverence and goes back into the cave. So he meets the Lord in the silent breeze, or in the sound of a breeze, in the gentle breeze. Not in any massive displays of power, but he meets him in in the, the, the silence, the gentleness, the hiddenness. Even a breeze isn't visible. You can see its effects, but you can't see it. You can see the bushes or trees bow somewhat in a breeze, but you can't see the breeze. So this is, it's an invitation to us into contemplation, right? So not just, again, for many people, when it comes to, to, to God, the standard seems to be, I, I believe he exists, you know, and it's as if we're after doing something amazing by believing he exists. 
you know, you believe or you don't believe. Well, if you do believe he exists, wow, you believe in God. So what? So what? Just so you know, Satan believes in him too. <laughs> like, believing God exists means, now it's, okay, it's, it's, it doesn't mean nothing, but it means very, very little. Uh, because that doesn't imply any sort of relationship at all. So the mystics, if you will, or, or any theologians of the church and the tr church's tradition have spoken about these three, uh, they call them the ways or the paths, right? Just the kind of uh, standards by which we can, we can recognize where we are in our faith journey. So the first way is the, the, the purgative way. This is where I recognize I've sinned in my life and I try to, to the grace of God, uproot that sin, get rid of it, heal it, you know, give up my addictions, uh, have a, a more regular prayer life, uh, allow the Lord in. Okay, purgative. So it's from purging to clean, purgatory, you know, a cleaning, purifying. So I begin to purify myself for the grace of God. Okay, that's purgative way. Then there's the illuminative way. So after we've been purified of these sins and failures and hopefully, you know, addictions and all those kind of things as well healed, now my mind is open to be, to be illuminated more by God. So now I'm starting to, to live according to his will. I'm starting to, to ask for his direction and do what he asks and live a, a, a holier life with a much more consistent and firm prayer life. That's the illuminative way. But it doesn't stop there. The final step is the, the unitive way where I live in, in a, a constant communion with God. I might not always feel that, by the way. So you, people like your Mother Teresa so that speak about that unity she had with God, even though she didn't feel his presence for decades. But she knew in her heart of hearts, this is knowing rather than feeling, she knew in her heart of hearts that she is united with him, that she lives for him, she lives from him, that all that she does is for his greater glory that I want my will and his will to be united. I want my heart and his heart to beat as one. Do you see how far that is from just believing God exists? Do you know, like they're, they're eons apart. They're, they're not the same thing at all. Believing God exists allows us then possibly to engage in the purgative way and then in the illuminative way and then in the unitive way. So this life that we're called to with the Lord is so much more, it's so, so much richer than people believe. And that's why, I mean, even for, for, for myself, uh, as, a, as, a, as a priest, I'm called to ever deepen my relationship with the Lord. It's not that I have, because just because I have a call or just because I've gone through theological training or something, it's just because I've been ordained, that's it, I'm done. You know, my holiness has been achieved. Not even close. Not even close. Every single day, I have to engage in this way too. You know, this this. Uh, hopefully, the purgative way is more or less finished. Hopefully, I'm engaging now more in the illuminative way. I'm trying to live my life according to God's will, in order that one day, with the help of God, I might achieve that that unitive way where my only desire is to do His will, where He is my everything. Because when we reach that, then you're ready for heaven. So St. Teresa of, of Avila, she describes contemplation as the following. I think this is what we're hopefully aiming for. You know, when we think of God present in the silent breeze, this is, this is contemplation. This is entering into your interior life with the Lord. And she describes contemplation as nothing else than a close sharing between friends. It means taking time frequently to be alone with him whom we know loves us. Taking time frequently to be alone with him who we know loves us. St. John of the Cross writes as regards contem con contemplative prayer or contemplation. What we need most in order to make progress is to be silent before this great God with our appetites, so our, our desires, with our appetites, and our tongue, interesting. For the language he best hears is silent love. The language he best hears 
is silent love. So this is contemplative prayer, contemplation. It's, it's interior. So our prayer life has its external points. So for example, Mass is a, should be both an exterior prayer, if you will, and interior. So things happen on the outside. Yes, you know, we, we see the gifts being brought forward and the consecration, then you receive Holy Communion. These are external things, but these should be representative of an internal reality. It was the, the thing that, that the Jews in the Old Testament always struggled with when they would sacrifice an animal in atonement for their sins. The idea wasn't just that we go to the temple, we slaughter this animal, and then God's happy. No, you go to the temple, the animal is slaughtered as a, as a sign or a symbol of the fact that I am sorry. So it's an external sign, which is supposed to represent an internal reality. The problem was it often didn't. They do the externals, and they do the external prayers, and they do all the, the things on the outside, but inside their, in their hearts there was still corruption and jealousy and uh, mistreatment of the orphan and the poor. This is what Jesus had no time for. He was so clear about it. Like, he just has no time for this external blah, blah, when inside their hearts there's corruption. It's kind of like when you think of maybe some of those mafia movies, you know, from the uh, Goodfellas or, or, or the Godfather. The mafia families would insist on going to Mass every Sunday. And then after Mass, we'd go out and kill Paulie, <laughs> you know? So going to Mass and then after Mass. Go kill someone. Like, sorry, what do you think this is all about? Like, so what's the, the, the goal of contemplation? What's, what's, what's the point of it? What are we supposed to do? What are, we, what, what are we aiming to get towards? I think what we're aiming to arrive at is interior transformation. So the, the goal of contemplation is, is unity with the Lord which brings about transformation. So, because I'm united with the Lord, this changes me. It, I'm transformed. It changes the way I think. It changes the way I see myself and the value I place on myself. If I'm united with the Lord, then I, I, with, with all humility, I know that I have value. I know that, that the Lord loves me. I know that the Lord died for me, that, that, that I'm worth something. If I'm united with the Lord, if, I, if I'm entering into contemplation, entering into this, this, this uh, area of transformation, this place of transformation, then I'll also recognize my brother and sister, who they are, and their value and worth, and the need to fight for life and for justice and so on. And in, in contemplation, in this interior transformation, I come to know God. I come to know his heart. Just, well, just a fraction of his heart, because it's infinite. So I come to know that, that, that just astounding, infinite love. And when we find that, that's the kind of place where words just aren't necessary anymore. You sit there with the Lord, just dumbfounded at, at how good he is and how how patient he is, and how he, he waits for the right moment and how things do work out. Not necessarily at the pace that we would have wanted, but they do work out. They work out in the right way, in the best way. Because he knows what he's doing. But in, in this contemplation, it's in, this, in this place of transformation, we come to discover that. And just simply, as I say, rest in it. We just, it's just not much to say anymore. It's just all. Oh. So in our own prayer lives, I think it's, it's good for us to know what, what the goal is, what we're supposed to be working towards. Otherwise, we might just be happy enough just to turn up for Mass or turn up for adoration or turn up for prayer. And of course, okay, that's, that's a minimum, and it's good to turn up. Please turn up. Please turn up on time. Great. But that's not the goal. The goal is to be engage in this purgative way, be purified, illuminative way, the Lord illuminates our conscience, our intellect and our will. And then that we, we come to a, a profound unity with him, that we enter into this contemplative prayer, which leads to interior transformation. 
And if we achieve that, if we can get there, then we will discover that the Lord truly is enough. And then we lack nothing. The Lord himself passed by. There came a mighty wind so strong that it tore the mountains and shattered the rocks. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind came an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire there came the sound of a gentle breeze. And when Elijah heard this, he covered his face with his cloak. Lord Jesus, teach us contemplative prayer that we might experience this interior transformation. Amen.